St. Petersburg, a city raised by Peter the Great from a Russian swampland to be a fortress and a royal residence. In 1762, Catherine the Great began to fill this palace with masterpieces of art. In time, this monument to culture came to be called the Hermitage. Within its walls are the works by great masters, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Rembrandt, Renoir. The Hermitage Halls and Galleries memorialize the great characters and events of Russian history. Alexander I, who decimated Napoleon's invading armies. Nicholas I, who commissioned a sumptuous addition to the Hermitage and then incredibly sold off many of its treasures. Lenin, the architect of the Russian Revolution who took art from the mansions of the rich to give to the masses. For Lenin, the Hermitage was a magnificent public compensation. He did not have much food to offer the people, but he could give them the art and palaces of the Tsars. Ordinary people could feel that in some imprecise way this magnificent residence belonged to them. Working class people could see what they've gotten from the revolution and perhaps their empty stomachs could endure a little longer. And then St. Petersburg itself, which during its tragic 900-day Nazi siege saw a million of its people die. But through tragedy and rebirth, the Hermitage has endured. Like the Louvre in Paris, it remains one of the great museums in the world. And then St. Petersburg itself, which during its tragic 900-day Nazi siege, saw a million of its people die. But through tragedy and rebirth, the Hermitage has endured. Like the Louvre in Paris, it remains one of the great museums in the world. This extraordinary place is an art museum, one of the greatest in the world. It has also been a great many other things. It was the palace of the Russian Tsars, the seat of absolute imperial authority. Great ideas were conceived in these opulent chambers, but above everything else, the Hermitage remains, represents, and is remembered as a repository of art. The Hermitage collection has been accumulated for over two centuries by one Tsarina, six Tsars, and the communist commissars who came after them. The palace which houses the collection is itself a work of art. Its 1,000 rooms express the taste of two centuries, from replications of ancient Roman mosaics to the Baroque complexities of the 18th century. The extensions to the Winter Palace were called Hermitages. The name now refers to all five buildings of the Hermitage, including the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace was begun in 1754, 29 years after Peter the Great's death, by his daughter Elizabeth. It was larger than the Louvre and the Tuileries put together, and it was designed to be St. Petersburg's crowning masterpiece, the official home of the Tsars, the function it fulfilled for about 150 years. In 1762, when Catherine the Great assumed power, it was here in the Winter Palace. Over the next 34 years, she presided over one of the most glorious and turbulent epochs of Russian history. Accumulated over 30 years, Catherine the Great's collection of pictures, which were the basis of the Hermitage, surpassed what the Louvre in Paris had collected for over four centuries. The Gotskovsky collection was also a personal 
and political coup for the new Tsarina. The pictures had been collected for King Friedrich of Prussia, the idol of Catherine the Great's late husband, Peter III. But Friedrich had got himself involved in Europe's Seven Years' War and was broke. Catherine the Great was not. When recreating the Jordanian staircase, now called the main staircase, as it is the chief entrance to the museum, architect Stasov echoed Rostrelli's objective by designing a ceremonial entrance on so grand a scale that it would immediately impress the visitor by its opulent majesty. It is indeed staggering by its dimensions and splendor, enhanced by the glittering wall mirrors, which by their reflections of the windows further increase the effect of spaciousness. After the first flight of steps of the same brilliant creamy Carrara marble as the handrails, the stairs fork in two broad sweeps to right and left. Rising up imposingly above the second floor balustrade is an elegant colonnade of grey Serdobolsky granite. Here the eye is caught by the huge ceiling painting, which at the soaring height of 22 meters makes the ceiling seem much higher than it really is. The ceiling painting, depicting the gods on Olympus, was painted to the design of the Italian Gasparo Tiziani. The sumptuous elaborate decor is further augmented by graceful statues of mythological deities on the Rococo strapwork ornament of gilded alabaster and plaster. It is by these stairs that the high-ranking dignitaries ascended to meet the Russian emperors. In the 19th century, the staircase was also named Jordanian because during the celebrations of Epiphany, the members of the imperial family descended it to the frozen Neva River where an ice hole, a Jordan, would be made to perform a water consecration ritual. The memorial room of Peter the Great, formerly the small throne room, was designed in 1833 by the architect Auguste Montferron and restored after the 1837 conflagration by the architect Stasov almost exactly as before. Along the upper part of the wall are panels painted in tempera on canvas by the Italian artists Barnaba Medici and Pietro Scotti and depicting the emperor at the famous battles of Poltava and Lesnaya. Between the columns of Jasper, in the large central niche, hangs a painting of Peter the Great, led by the goddess of wisdom Minerva, the work of the Venetian painter Jacopo Amigani. The silver gilded imperial throne was made in late 18th century. The room's walls are draped with the red French velvet. Embroidered with silver threads upon the velvet are the images of double-headed eagles, the monogram of Peter I, and plant ornaments. The large armorial hall, its floor space is 1,000 square meters, served as the venue for ceremonial events. It was decorated by the architect Stasov with a Corinthian colonnade and a balustraded gallery along the perimeter. The armorial hall is always flooded with the light, emitted by the shining gilding. The name of this room, the second largest in the Winter Palace, is directly associated with its decor abundant in the coats of arms of Russia's provinces and the cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg displayed on the gilded chandeliers. You can also see the sculptured groups of warriors 
clad in old Russian armor along the frontal walls. The armorial hall was designed for formal receptions in honor of the dignitaries representing provincial nobility. Besides, the members of the imperial family would walk in the ceremonial procession through this very room heading to the grand church of the Winter Palace. On such memorable occasions, the bypass gallery of the armorial hall was crowded with the invited public and the media. In 1826, Carlo Rossi designed a picture gallery to display 332 portraits of the war heroes against Napoleon either made from life or the portraits of the slain heroes made from life by the well-known painter George Daw and two Russian artists, Alexander Polyakov and Wilhelm Golike. Central is the portrait of Field Marshal Mikhail Kutuzov, the commander-in-chief of the Russian armed forces, who is depicted against the snow-swept plains across which the troops are marching. The portraits of the Russian officers eloquently convey the mood of heroic uplift characteristic of the period. At the far end of the gallery is the immense equestrian portrait of the Emperor Alexander I. He won the gratitude and adulation of the people of Europe for turning back what seemed to be an unopposable tide of French conquest. When redesigning the St. George's Hall, originally called the Grand Throne Room, the Arctic Stasov strove to impart to it the air of austere majesty by means of just two colors, white and gold. Indeed, the white Carrara marble used for the columns, the walls, the low relief of St. George, the symbol of Russia's might, and the white ceiling offer a striking contrast to the gilt or molo mounts of the immense chandeliers, the gilded capitals and bases of the columns, and the details of the gallery balusters. The ceiling decor of embossed bronze, also gilded, faithfully reproduces the design of the parquet flooring of 16 different types of wood. The architect Stasov also designed a highly original construction which stood the test of time. He used only metal for a ceiling of 800 square meters in area. The iron girders and sheets of copper, painted white on the underside, were anchored in place by massive ship's chains. In the place of the monarch's seat, restored in 2000, stands a throne draped with velvet and adorned with gilded silver. It was made of fumed oak in 1731 by the English craftsman Clausen for the Empress Anna Ioannovna. The carved armrests of the throne terminate in sculpted eagle heads. The legs are shaped in the likeness of mighty claws holding gilded spheres. The coat of arms of the Russian Empire is embroidered in silver on its back and replicated on the scarlet background behind the throne. Although somewhat eclectic in style, combining the elements of the Renaissance and Moorish styles, with graceful galleries resting on elegant marble columns on the floor decorated by a half-sized copy of the ancient Roman mosaic, nonetheless the interior decor represents a cohesive whole. A notable curio on display here is the Peacock Clock, the work of James Cox, a leading 18th century British clockmaker. The hours and minutes are indicated in the window, cut out 
in the cap of a mushroom. And when the chimes play, the peacock spreads its plumage and nods, the owl blinks and turns its head, and the rooster crows. The highly intricate mechanism is in full working order. In 1764, Catherine had a winter garden built on the main level of the Winter Palace. It was enclosed, it was filled with exotic birds, plants and monkeys. The tropics had been brought to the frozen north. The Tsarina had two pavilions put up on either side of the garden, and there she gave dinner parties and hung pictures. This was the beginning of the addition to the Winter Palace that Catherine the Great called her Hermitage. The word Hermitage means, of course, the dwelling place of a hermit, usually a holy man. In naming the great extension to the Winter Palace, she simply followed the tradition of her day. Many great estates in 18th century Europe had elegant little hermitages used for informal entertaining, reading, and gossiping. Servants were excluded so that the royal guests need not fear that their antiques would be reported to their critics. There could be little doubt that the early Renaissance in Italy stands as one of the most beloved and studied periods of art history. The emergence of humanistic art and culture from the ashes of medieval feudalism has fascinated generations of art lovers. Here we will trace the origins of the Renaissance through the lovely and compelling artworks of the 14th and 15th century Italy housed in the Hermitage Museum. It was the age of the powerful Medici family, the Golden Age of Florence, and the innovative painting of artists like Fra Angelico, Simone Martini, and Fra Filippo Lippi. Artists reawakened to the beauty of the human figure and the nobility of the individual. Religion turned from strict doctrines to a search for God in the beauty of natural things, a search led not by the church, but by the personal intuition of the individual. The best incarnation of Gothic tradition in Italian painting is represented by the work of Simone Martini, as well as the Sienese school of painting as a whole. The pictures dedicated to the image of the Madonna are the best in the work of Simone Martini. One of the masterpieces on the subject, Madonna from Annunciation Scene, a panel from a diptych, is in the Hermitage. The other panel, with the Archangel Gabriel, is in the National Gallery in Washington. Mary's image, created by Simone Martini, is still imbued with a purely medieval subtle beauty. The volume is barely indicated, and the proportions are quite unnatural. The major artistic tasks here were the exquisite color palette and the live and beautiful outline. These qualities endowed the Madonna's image with charming femininity. In the 19th century, this brilliantly colored fresco was cut from the walls of a destroyed monastery on the outskirts of Florence, Italy, and sold to the Hermitage. The artist is Fra Angelico the famous 15th century monk and painter. Fra Angelico was a master of fresco painting, a technique that required speed as well as many skilled assistants. First, a layer of plaster is applied. Before the area dries, the painter colors it with pigments diluted in water. The city of Florence had been recorded in history as the cradle of the Renaissance. 
One of the city's greatest attractions was the workshop of the Della Robbia family. Their sculpted terracotta figures were covered with an opaque colored glaze. This nativity scene dates from the late 15th century. It is set in a typical Italian landscape, complete with the details of country life. Impervious to moisture, the glazed terracotta could be used both inside and outside. These decorations sometimes covered the fronts of churches or other buildings. The Della Robbia workshop was famous for what was called the sweet style. It avoided dramatic extremes, investing its subjects instead with the serene spiritual magnetism. The work is not the product of one man, but of the whole family who pioneered this technique of vitreous glazes on terracotta. Adoration of the newborn child is one of the happiest of the Christian themes, whether this is by the mother alone or includes Joseph, angels, shepherds, magi, donors, or any combination of the above. All allow viewers a special sense of engagement, adding the adoration to the painted participants. Shown in a circle with a deep cosmic landscape background, Filipino Lippi's Tondo, Adoration of the Christ Child, stresses Mary's future role as Queen of Heaven. Born in Spain, most of Dominic's life was spent in France and Italy, countering heretical movements and founding his monastic order. Here he answers the wrath of Christ, a small figure seen in the clouds holding three arrows intended to punish pride, avarice and lust. Botticelli retreated to the somber religious themes following severe criticism by the fanatical moralist monk Savonarola. In this work, Saint Dominic foresees the Last Judgment, just as Savonarola did, as he called for the bonfire of the vanities to purify Florence. Indeed, the final days of the Florentine Golden Age were close at hand. Among the few Florentine 15th century pictures in the Hermitage, Filipino Lippi's Annunciation may be one of the most complex. Humbly kneeling, Gabriel's manner reflects the gravity of his message, acknowledging and announcing Mary as future Queen of Heaven. The Holy Ghost, third member of the Trinity, flies in from the left about to enter Mary's ear for the Incarnation. A beautiful still life shows the scattered prophetic books Mary was reading just before this moment of fruition. Her gesture, fingers humbly laced in her lap, refers to the line where Mary describes herself as the handmaid of the Lord, Anquila Domini. Sebastian was a young Roman soldier, twice subjected to martyrdom. He was an officer at the imperial army and the favorite of the Emperor Diocletian. Because he embraced Christianity and ardently preached the faith, he was shot by Roman archers. So at the trial, Sebastian was condemned to death by archery. He survived the first shower of arrows those removed by Saints Irene and Lucilla, whose loving care cured him, making him a holy healer. Pagans caught on that beheading was the best way to kill a martyr, and ultimately subjected Sebastian to that fate. Though as many arrows as the quills of a hedgehog supposedly pierced Sebastian, thanks to the Renaissance cult of the body beautiful, Fewer and fewer of them were allowed to penetrate the splendor of his skin. 
Perugino runs the little dart through the saint's neck, inscribing his na own name upon it, as if that sharp point was the source of the soldier saint's terminal bliss. The High Renaissance in Italy lasted less than 30 years, yet this brief epoch marks one of the highest peaks of human spirit and creative genius. Artists were the leaders of this new age, and their genius was thought to be divinely inspired. Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, and uh, the glittering gallery of Venetian painters produced works of such miraculous originality that they were placed on a par with poets, princes, and philosophers. For centuries, their work would be the standard to which all others would be compared. So the masters of the High Renaissance, built on the discoveries of the early Renaissance to drive art to the limits of beauty, they were seen as supermen possessed with the rare power of divine creation. And for all time, the status of the artist changed. Seeking absolute truths about man and the universe, they reached new levels of harmony, balance, and technical virtuosity. Generations of artists have built on their achievements, adding new level of passion, emotion, and drama. Leonardo da Vinci, the first master of the High Renaissance, lived from 1452 to 1519. He was really more than an artist. He was a scientist and a thinker who personified the name the Renaissance Man. His notebooks record insights and inventions so numerous they could not hope to be realized within the scope of one lifetime. Madonna with a flower was painted when he was only 26 in 1478. Like no other master before him, Leonardo shows Madonna and the child in all their human spontaneity. Expressions emerge into the light from Leonardo's smoky sfumato haze. He pioneered a technique known as sfumato or smoke in Italian the blending of light and shade in imperceptibly subtle gradations. The virgin's delighted smile is the smile of a woman, and the child plays like any other baby. The chief impression this picture evokes is not its genre element, but the natural analysis of the inner world of a man, the awakening of consciousness in a child. The child is curious about the flower, as if being in a normal, childish relationship with the world. The face of Mary, whose dress and hair are done in the latest Florentine fashion of the time, is marked by a placid smile. The natural gestures combine the characters into a unified group. The harmonious stability of the composition is typical not only of Leonardo, but of the Renaissance painting in general. Leonardo had a special affinity for birds. He paid owners to free them. Here the baby clutches a finch, the symbol of his suffering, death and resurrection. The Madonna's sublime and gentle gaze focuses on the Christ child. The child's gaze focuses outward, drawing the spectator into the painting. Two compelling arched apertures like eyes are the windows to the Madonna Litter's soul. Where Esther's beauty won a Persian king and her courage the salvation of her people, the same attributes enabled Judith to seduce and slay the Jews' enemy, the Assyrian commander Holofernes, 
whom she murdered in his tent after getting him drunk. In Giorgione's painting, whose verticality follows Judith's standing figure, she looks down at the severed head of Holofernes under her foot. Her exquisitely bared leg is revealed as the weapon, leading to the Assyrian's fall. Venice, one of Europe's most militant and romantic centers, found Judith's apocryphal book appealing, as did Florence, because both states were republics. Bought with Croza's collection as a Raphael, this Judith may be the Hermitage's greatest rarity, one of the handful of paintings that even the crustiest of experts agree to be by the leading artist of the early Renaissance in Venice, Giorgione. So the values of the High Renaissance evolved in a different way in the cosmopolitan city of Venice. There, Giorgione, the contemporary of Raphael, was the first of the Renaissance masters. In 1504, he painted the Jewish biblical heroine Judith, a widow and great beauty, Judith saved her city by seducing and beheading the general of the Assyrian invading army Holofernes. She would carry his severed head back to her people. The heavy sword rests in her tiny hand. Especially close to Christ, Mary was the first mortal to whom he appeared after the resurrection. She was the sibling of the industrious Martha and of Lazarus, whose dead body was the first to be raised by Christ. She and Mary argued before Christ about the two ways of life, the contemplative versus the active. He agreed with Mary in speaking for the superiority of the first. Mary Magdalene here affords the faithful, the lustful of both a legitimate occasion to see a beautiful penitent wearing very little but halon tresses, looking very well indeed, as she does good by renouncing the bad. The penitent Mary Magdalene by Titian is one of the pearls of the Hermitage collection. Mary Magdalene kneels outside of her cave, to which she had fled to renounce earthly pleasures in devotion to God. The expressive beauty of the painting emphasizes the deep grief of the penitent sinner. Her book rests on a skull, reminder of mortality. Her attribute is a bottle of mere oil with which she anointed Christ's feet. The work is in the tradition of painting hermit saints. A celestial explosion of gold links heaven and earth as Jupiter joins Danae, long locked away in a tower, impregnating her in the form of a shower of glittering coins Perseus being the fruit of their union. Whom old Titian may have painted this image for is an open question, as it remained in his own home until after his death. The artist may well have worked on this canvas for purely personal purposes. It is a painted prayer for health and fortitude as the slings and arrows of extreme old age assailed him, demanding to be dealt with on every level, physical, spiritual, and artistic. In the painting of St. Sebastian by Titian, the dominant mood is tragic. The brushwork itself seemingly reflects depressing agitation. Only in the dolorous look of the young hero can we see no weakness. His personality was not broken by hard trials and tribulations. He stands out against the background of darkness and chaos as an unsubdued man.
By the mid-1780s, Catherine had become bored with art collecting. Drama became her new passion. She had this exquisite little theater built at the far end of the Hermitage. The decor was in the high neoclassical style. The seating was limited. The stage was designed to accommodate operas as well as plays. Catherine had always loved the theater. She wrote plays and the libretti for five operas, all featuring prominent figures from Russian history. Raphael placed his exquisite, minute Conestabile Madonna within the confines of a circle symbolizing perfection and infinity. Originally, as is known from the preparatory drawing in Berlin, Raphael wanted the child to hold a pomegranate. This would have repeated the secularity of the painting's format. But then he changed that motif to the present book. Mother and child are now united, not only as new Adam and new Eve, but also in looking at the sacred text, one that prophesies those events that they will live and die to share. Happily, the panel is in its original frame of the artist's devising. Option number two. But Leonardo's inventions and discoveries were theoretical. His unquenchable curiosity that led from one incomplete project to the next has led his patrons to regard him as a fickle. They turned instead to the young Raphael, Leonardo's junior by 31 years. This is Raphael's Conestabile Madonna. The stable composition, based on the pyramid form, is reminiscent of the master. He was only 19 when he painted this work. A few years later, he would be called to Rome by the Pope to paint the Vatican frescoes. Raphael's innovation in this work is his use of a brighter palette. He has taken the Madonna outdoors, but he also learned from Leonardo the technique of modeling faces from light and shade, as well as the use of a distant landscape as a backdrop for his painting. Even the frame is not a casual detail, but forms an integral whole with a painting. It was made according to Raphael's sketches. Raphael was the painter of style and elegance. He mastered the art of difficult, look easy. He was also the luminary of the papal court, executing one after another successful commissions. This work was painted when he was 23. Scholars still consider it to be a mature work because it displays all the simplicity, clarity, and harmony that marked the works of the High Renaissance. Raphael was quite financially successful. Part of his success could be traced to his highly social nature. Unlike Michelangelo, who worked completely alone, Raphael would eventually employ as many as 50 assistants to quickly complete large commissions such as the Vatican frescoes. He was so well liked that when he died suddenly at the age of 37, the entire court was devastated. One of Raphael's pupils was Lorenzo Lorenzetti who sculpted this work, Dead Boy on a Dolphin, after one of Raphael's drawings. The story behind the sculpture comes from a classical legend. The dolphin, a pagan symbol of immortality, has ferried the dead boy ashore. It was Lorenzetti who designed the sculpture for the tomb of Raphael, his teacher. To Michelangelo, art was the making of man, an act of divine creation. He said that he liberated the figure from the marble that imprisoned it. 
his crouching boy expresses man's strength but also his weakness. His characters often struggle against adversity but are unable to triumph. The statue was carved from a single piece of marble and the rough surface retains traces of the sculptor's chisel work. The boy's body in the crouching boy is full of potential force but compressed as if subdued we can feel the strengthening of the tragic world outlook inherent in the sculptor. All the beautiful still life elements along with the singer himself suggest the sum total of the five senses. Sound and sight by the youth's voice and eyes, his lute, viola, and music sheets, taste by the fruit, scent by the flowers, touch by the young man's hands upon his instrument. Veronese is linked with harmony more than conflict, yet when he had to deal with violence, he did so with surprising skill and nowhere more so than in his conversion of Saul with all its requisite turbulence. Saul, on the road to Damascus, falls from his horse blinded by heavenly light. He almost rolls out of the picture as he hears the voice of Christ asking him in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Here the protagonist, soon to convert to Christianity and be renamed Paul, is almost overshadowed by the staggering array of horseflesh and fleeing warriors, yet the saint-to-be just barely manages to hold his own within this magnificent frieze-like composition. At one of her banquets, the queen dissolved a priceless pearl in vinegar and drank it down to prove the extent of her wealth. With her lover Mark Anthony dead, and the prospect of Roman slavery before her, the 39-year-old Egyptian queen ended her life by applying an asp to her breast, a very popular subject as it tempered nudity, history, and undying love, Cleopatra's suicide was depicted by the Neapolitan painter Massimo Stanzioni. The great, unusually well-preserved Tintoretto canvas of the birth of St. John the Baptist stages the event in a patrician Venetian setting. His aged father, literally dumbstruck by the miraculous event, stands at the far right, because Elizabeth, in her childbed, is far too old to nurse the baby. A wet nurse in the foreground is about to do so, near the Virgin Mary, who will give the newborn baby a bath. Mary takes on a role that John will assume, in turn, when baptizing her son many years later. In June of 1941, Hitler's Germany invaded the Soviet Union and advanced toward Leningrad. The Nazis intended to completely level the city. At the Hermitage, in preparation for evacuation, Crates for each work of art had already been constructed. The staff packed 24 hours a day without stopping. However, empty frames were left on the walls as the symbols of the staff's faith that the art would someday come back. Within 10 days, the galleries have been totally stripped of their treasures. Nearly 2 million pieces have been packed. Three trains were waiting to take them deep into the Russian heartland. At dawn on July 1, 1941, Joseph Orbelli, the director of the museum, was standing on the platform weeping 
as the first two trains pulled out of the station. The trains were going to a hiding place so secret that even the engineers didn't know their final destination. The third train never left. Hitler's forces had closed the circle around the city. The siege of Leningrad had begun. Two and a half million people were trapped inside Leningrad with all the supply routes cut off. The terrible winter of 1942 was one of the coldest on record. Fuel reserves were exhausted. The water supply no longer functioned. Daily bread rations were cut to four ounces per person. During the siege, the Hermitage remained open to the public. The works that had not been packed for evacuation remained on display. In the Hermitage workshops, there were pots of joiner's glue used to make frames. The starving staff survived on a jelly made from that glue. The siege had become a test of the human spirit. As bombs fell outside, the Hermitage basement housed the museum staff and their families. The concussions from exploding shells blasted out most of the Hermitage's window panes. Winter storms blew in through shattered windows. The skylight in Nicholas's the first main gallery was smashed. Snow and glass fell on the exquisite parquet floors. The starving staff painstakingly removed the mixture of snow and glass, bucket by bucket. Young soldiers came in to replace the broken glass and clean up. One of the guides, Pavel Gubchevsky, gave them a special tour. He described in detail the pictures that had hung in each empty frame. His descriptions were so vivid that they could almost see Rembrandt's prodigal son and Leonardo da Vinci's Madonna. The siege of Leningrad lasted 900 days. One million civilians died. Such canvases as these captured the fly-by-night nature of festivity, selling as costly souvenirs. Often the sums spent on state occasions represented a significant portion of the annual official expenditure as these receptions had diplomatic or rather propagandistic functions. Artists recorded such events not only to paint pretty pictures, but also to document the pomp and circumstance designed to dazzle the visiting dignitary, and last but not least, to show where and how the money went, keeping a pictorial grip on the ephemeral. Antonio Canaletto, with his painstaking eye and hand for detail, was ideally suited to this sort of commemorative documentary image. In his reception of the French ambassador in Venice, magnificent state gondolas lie alongside the Doge's palace and the Chiesa della Salute is seen in the distance. Here we have a heroic feat in Baroque composition, The Death of Adonis, by the Italian sculptor Giuseppe Mazzuola. The twisting spiral of the figure begs the viewer to circle the sculpture and admire it from various angles. Venus foresaw the death of her lover Adonis and warned him not to go hunting. The sculptor chooses to portray Adonis in his last moment of fleeting balance as he tries to escape the wild boar who would kill him. The beautiful youth, about to fall to his death, 
is shown in a violent dynamic motion in this virtuoso work. Striving for the true depiction of human emotions, the death of Adonis possesses a theatrical energy inherent in classical tragedy. Adonis lets out a cry of help before surrendering to death. The work is a fine example of sculpture in the round. The spiraling composition shows the influence of the Italian Baroque sculptor Bernini. Because the viewer must walk around to see it completely, the work is intended for display in a large halls like this one or an outdoor park. Equally titillating is Batoni's Hercules between love and wisdom, where a naked hero glowers at wise Athena as she points to the rough high road of virtue. A deliciously decollet Venus waves a rose into Hercules's face, promising accessible joys of love if he takes the low road of earthly pleasures. Whom will he choose? That's for you to guess or know. Canova's lively sculpture, The Three Graces, is his most famous work in the Hermitage. The three young women are the handmaids of Venus, the personifications of grace and beauty. They represent the three phases of love beauty, desire, and fulfillment. With an interplay of gesture and motion, their reactions to one another create a vivacious energy and movement throughout the composition. The Hermitage Museum offers a panoramic view into cultures and civilizations that span the globe from the dawn of history. The museum was designed as the nation's treasure trove of world artistic accomplishments and here the art of the Spanish nation is particularly well represented. Here we are going to see the flowering of Spanish Baroque painting. The era begins in the 16th century when Spanish power was at its height. Under the mighty Habsburg dynasty, Spain ruled nearly all of Europe. This was the epoch of Cervantes, the age of idealism, a knightly service to a lofty dream, when the spirits of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza walked the earth. Spanish kings believed it was their divine mission to preserve Catholicism in Europe in the face of Protestant rebellions. You'll be seeing works produced during the age of Spanish Inquisition, when heretics were tried, tortured, and even put to death. Saint Jerome, the great scholar and philosopher, also suffered in the wilderness. Saint Jerome wrote, that whether it was night or day, whether he slept or was awake, he always heard the trumpet of the last judgment. We see him at the moment when he awakens to the voice of the trumpet that announces the end of the world, when the dead shall awaken and all will be judged. The lion is by his side. Jerome pulled a thorn from the lion's paw, and ever after the lion followed him. St. Lawrence of Spanish birth became the first deacon of the Roman Church. Lawrence gave away the church's treasures to the poor. When a Roman prefect demanded the treasures, Lawrence pointed to the sick and the poor surrounding him, saying, Here are your treasures. He was roasted on this gridiron for his acts. Like many renditions of the saints, he holds in his hand the instrument of his martyrdom. 
but the bright parting of the skies overhead is a common pictorial device to indicate divine blessing or other communion. The Girlhood of the Virgin Possibly following a mystical account where she pricks her finger, that initial bloodshed a prefiguring of a life of sacrifice. One of Mary's girlhood labors in the temple was the sewing of its great curtain, which will tear at the moment of Christ's death. Placement of the white cloth on her lap intimates that project, as well as the pieta, when, with a winding sheet across her knees, she will cradle Christ's dead body in her arms. Here the Counter-Reformation within the Catholic Church reaches out to common people. The Virgin is seen in a new way, not as an icon, but as a little girl who sews and prays. Murillo's skill in rendering children is phenomenal. The boy looks natural and unposed. In his non-religious paintings, Murillo chooses precious moments and freezes them in time. Charmed by the images of poor but happy children, he has become known as the painter of little beggars. This composition suggests a split screen evenly divided between the exploration of nature and of humanity. Here the smooth-skinned Jacob, with his mother Rebecca's connivance, receives the blessing blind Isaac believes he is giving his favorite, Jacob's hairy twin Esau. Jacob has covered his arm in animal skin so that his blind father would think that he was touching Esau's hairy arm. Rebecca masterminded the plot upon overhearing her husband telling Esau that he would give his blessing after Esau had hunted game and prepare a special meal for his father. But Jacob prepared the meal instead, and dressing in his brother's clothing, he received the blessing, becoming master. Esau hunts in the distance. When he returns, he would be outraged. Esau pledged to kill his younger brother as soon as Isaac was dead, but Rebecca sent Jacob away to live in another town until Esau's fury subsided. Jacob wandered until he became exhausted and fell by the roadside. There a prophetic dream came to him, he saw the stairs leading to heaven and angels going up and down. It was a revelation of his destiny. And the Lord spoke to him, saying, I am the Lord and the God of your forefathers, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you are lying I will give to you and your descendants. These shall be as plentiful as the dust of the earth, and through them you shall spread out east and west, north and south. In you all the nature of the earth shall find blessing. Here is the painting by the famous realist artist Francisco Goya, who achieved his greatest success as a painter after an illness robbed him of his hearing portrait of the actress Antonia de Zarate. This portrait was painted in 1810, one year before she died of tuberculosis. This is Velazquez's portrait of the man who introduced him to the court of King Philip IV, the Count Duke Olivares. Here Velazquez creates a neutral backdrop focusing our attention only on Olivares. We see a clever, energetic, and authoritative man with intelligence in his eyes. 
He is not idealized, nor is his nobility emphasized. It is his singular personality, his unique round face and the dapper moustache that we notice. Peter, key in hand, is seen to the right of the bald Paul in a double portrait by El Greco. Peter and Paul may have been paired by El Greco because they came to Rome together and both were sentenced to death by Nero at the same time. Paul has his hand on a book, probably his epistles. In his hand, Peter holds his famous key to heaven, given to him by Christ. Paul is confident and authoritative. Notice the contrast between Paul's expression and Peter's troubled look. Peter has denied Christ fulfilling Christ's prophecy. Luis de Morales stressed Jesus' self-sacrifice as already manifested in infancy. He grasps a yarn winder that resembles a miniature crucifix and holds a bobbin. Both objects pertain to the miraculous robe that tradition holds was made for him as a baby by the Virgin and that grew along with its wearer and was worn to Calvary. Misunderstood in his own day, Rembrandt is now considered one of the geniuses of Western art. Suffering the death of many loved ones, disfavor of his peers and bankruptcy, Rembrandt nevertheless created works of unforgettable significance. This is Rembrandt's descent from the cross. He became the master of effects, dramatic lighting, personality and gesture. It is a night scene where Christ and his followers are united by the light. There's little idealization, but rather a sorrowful realization of the painful human death. Christ is no more than a pitiful dead mass, and we are uncomfortably aware of the difficult mechanics of getting him down. Rembrandt's wife, Saskia van Ullenberg, appears as the goddess Flora, her hair lavishly dressed with blossoms, holding a flowery staff. The artist celebrates his bride too, being in bloom, pregnant with their son Titus, whose birth in 1641 would soon result in Saskia's death. The year of 1634 was the time of great happiness for Rembrandt the year he married his wife Saskia. He painted her often. This time he paints her as Flora, the goddess of spring and flowers. She came from a wealthy, respected, upper-class family and managed to introduce her husband into those circles. In 1639, Rembrandt bought a large house for his soon-to-be-growing family. His career seem to be expanding by leaps and bounds, and he received a number of important commissions, but his dream was not to be. Saskia's first three children all tragically died in infancy. When Saskia herself died in 1642, within a year of the birth of their fourth son Titus, Rembrandt was devastated. Among Christ's hardest messages is that one is rewarded for essence, not effort, for being, not striving. Grace is always freely given, never deserved. You cannot work your way to heaven. Rembrandt's gloomy interior, where the laborers complain of being paid the same for a full day's work, as those who came in later and only put in an hour or so, illustrates Christ's parable of the laborers in the vineyard, of the mysterious ways to heaven's entry.
that brave and faithful general may be leaving for his final fatal battle. Without jealousy or rivalry, Jonathan and David share the Bible's best friendship. Learning of Jonathan's death, his stricken survivor could only lament, Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Following the Franciscan values of poverty, humility, and labor, many 17th century painters stressed the role of Joseph as a carpenter or, or that of Mary as a hard-working, middle-class mother rocking her baby in a wicker cradle, as shown by Rembrandt. Laboring in the background, Joseph uses carpenter's tools. Others hang on the wall. Throughout his career, Rembrandt was fascinated with the faces of the elderly and painted them often. He showed great interest in and identification with the old, with the poor, and the downtrodden. The artist shows us nothing of the subject's social position, his job, or the events of his life. We are confronted instead with the meditative side, the domain of his soul. Notice how lovingly Rembrandt records the sunken terrain of this old man's face. Overtly or covertly, sacrifice is always the central theme of the Bible and its art in the events that make it necessary and the ways in which it is fulfilled. The ghastly scene and subject of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac established the awesome extreme of obedience to divine dictate. Rembrandt, more than any other artist, captured the horror of that event. Abraham covers his son's face with his own swollen butcher's hand so that Isaac cannot see the paternal source of doom. Dramatic illumination picks out Isaac's body, the agonized face of his father, as well as the head and hands of the angel of deliverance, and the falling knife, highlighting the action in near cinematic fashion. Rembrandt added a surprising, almost incongruous refinement of detail which only serves to underscore the tension, brutality, and relief of this moment. Closest to home, and the most stirring of all parables, is one of the prodigal son. Having left home and squandered his birthright, the wastrel son returning in rags, he is welcomed back by his father with a joy and devotion that the dutiful son who stayed home cannot comprehend. Only a parent may fully appreciate this parable, painted by Rembrandt after all of his children were dead. Answering the perplexed state home's question as to why he celebrates, the father replies with two of the Bible's most moving lines. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Rembrandt brings a sense of the absolute to this scene of reconciliation by showing the prodigal from the back, so hiding his features, Rembrandt leaves his expression to that most powerful of the media, which is the viewer's imagination. And it is also a painting of hope, an interpretation of the Christian idea of mercy, the parable as old as the world itself. After long wanderings, Having squandered his inheritance, impoverished and repentant, the son returns to his father 
and receives his forgiveness. The bold son is ruined, repellent. His clothes hang in tatters. He has become an outcast. Even his shoes are worn through. The painting expresses a hope that the darkness of human existence will be illuminated by tenderness, that mankind will find refuge in God's forgiveness. Long before these hermitage palaces were built, a fascination with Dutch art took hold in Russia. It started with Peter the Great, who ruled the nation in the 18th century, from a now lost palace built on this very land. Peter's love for Dutch painting was synonymous with his love for the sea, and it was Dutch seascapes that Peter first acquired on one of his first trips to Europe. Holland back then was the greatest maritime power in the world, a nation of traders and seafarers. Fascinated with everything that the nation of Holland represented, Peter would devote much of his reign to winning his window on the west for his then landlocked nation, so that Russia too could become a mercantile power. Now the collection of Dutch painting has grown far beyond Peter's original seascapes. It is so extensive and varied that it would be quite possible to trace the history of Dutch painting exclusively through the works housed in these hermitage palaces. Rembrandt was not the only genius of this age. The entire Dutch art world was in its prime. In the early 17th century, after a long protracted struggle against Catholic Spain, the northern provinces of the Netherlands emerged as an independent state, today's Holland. In this Protestant, individualistic culture, religious images were stripped from churches. Church and state were now only minor patrons of the art. A private collector's media was born, and the subject matter of art has changed to suit the new patrons. They wanted portraits, landscapes, still lifes, and genre paintings to hang on the walls of their homes. Marshes might not seem likely subjects for romantic grandeur, but in the hands of Jacob van Roosdel, a bog takes on just that quality. We see great trees, dead and alive, rising from the water like creatures from another age, struggling against extinction. The objects are opulent, lustrous, and glowing. They almost leap from the canvas that looks so real. The waiting wine and food create what is called lively disorder. It is an artistic technique used to mimic the effect of human presence. We are made to feel that someone had just left the frame of the picture. Here the tastes and habits of the individual are revealed. The elegant crab and expensive polished objects tell us that it is a person of means and good taste. With his usual wit, Jan Steen shows a game of backgammon, possibly set in a body house, for the gentleman's pipe is at a suggestive angle towards the woman he may be playing with in every sense of the word. This lavishly furnished interior is lined with Spanish gilt leather wall covering. The wine cooler on the floor, with the ivy leaves around, points out that this chamber is in the realm of Bacchus, presumably for the paid-for pleasures of wine and women. The very first collection of artworks bought by Catherine the Great to grace the walls of the newly constructed Winter Palace came mainly from the tiny nation of Flanders, 
that we now know as Belgium. Some of the very works we're going to see were purchased by Catherine herself. It was Catherine who originated the idea of an all-encompassing collection of works of art to complement the royal residence in St. Petersburg. Today, the Hermitage Museum contains about 1,500 Flemish and Dutch artworks. The collection is known the world over for its size and quality. The 17th century artists painted in the spirit of counter-reformation. Catholic faith was revived in the Spanish-dominated territories, and Protestant rebellions were crushed. This was the era of the mighty Habsburg dynasty. The genius of Peter Paul Rubens thrived in this atmosphere. A linguist and a scholar, Rubens served as a liaison between Antwerp and the Spanish court. In painting, Rubens was responsible for the highest achievements of Catholic Flanders. He created a Flemish Baroque style, an extroverted in the dynamic approach to painting that glorified the world it represented. Rubens visited Italy and incorporated the bright colors and exuberant attitude of the Renaissance into his canvases. Peter Paul Rubens, adapting antique prototypes of a Roman statue of Sibylle, the maternal earth goddess, along with that of Neptune or river god, brought an allegory of the union of earth and water to a radiant life. Their hands joined upon a pouring vessel, symbolizing Antwerp's Shelder River. Earth, Antwerp, and her environs marries water that city's profitable river, harbor, and sea. Water god and earth goddess gaze into one another's eyes as their union is celebrated by a victory who places marital garlands upon their brows. This is an example of stoical virtue, of filial love, such as that of Pero for her aged, imprisoned father, Chimon, who was condemned to death by starvation. She saved his life by nursing him at her breast. Rubens has plausible depiction of that strange subject. A Roman woman's love for her father brought it a massive dignity, elevating what lesser hands and minds might have reduced to a risible incest fantasy to a moving image of rare solemnity. Rubens depicts a story from the book of Luke in his painting, A Feast at the House of Simon of the Pharisees. An adulteress is brought before Christ in the midst of a dinner at a prominent Jewish household. The traditional punishment for her crime is death by stoning. But Roman law has deprived the Jewish authorities of the power of the death penalty. You may go, do not sin again, he tells her. To the others, he says, the one of you who is faultless shall throw the first stone. Bacchus may seem rather appalling or delightful at the same time. He has the head of a young man, his body lost in rattled adiposity in a massively enlarged travesty. An innocent cherub relieves himself on the spur of the moment without an inkling of modesty. His mind is either far away or perhaps completely empty. A satire, part man, part goat, guzzles wine faster than most of us can drink water. Even the tiger, lying cat-like at the god's feet, gnaws upon a bunch of grapes. Here the daughter of the king of Ethiopia is freed from the bonds that chained her to a rock where she was guarded by a fearsome dragon. Perseus was able to slay the monster, shown in its death throes in the foreground, because he came equipped with Mercury's winged sandals on the helmet that made him invisible to his enemies. Perseus' shield is emblazoned with Medusa's petrifying stare. 
he was spared that Gorgon's fatal gaze as he slew her while she lay sleeping, the reward being Pegasus, the winged horse, who arose from her blood. Option number two. Perseus was flying on his winged horse when he saw Andromeda below. She was chained to a rock as a sacrifice to a sea monster. No stranger to heroics, Perseus flew down and slew the monster with the help of a shield etched with Medusa's petrifying stare. He got the shield when he slew Medusa, the terrifying Gorgon, whose gaze turned everyone who beheld her into stone. Andromeda, the daughter of the Ethiopian king, is led from her rock prison by Perseus. Standing by is Pegasus, a winged horse who arose from, her, from Medusa's blood. Philadelphia and Elizabeth Wharton shows Van Dyke's scintillating skills as a portrayer of children. Because he worked so fast, they suffered relatively little agony in holding that pose. Indeed, seem actually to have enjoyed the process. Never stiff or self-conscious, his pictures of children display freshness and immediacy. At the same time, they are mysterious, for their own future is unknown. The personalities of the children come through. The elder sister is playful, while the younger one is quite serious. Anthony Van Dyke shunned all the attributes of art to present himself as an archetypal gentleman. His languid ivory hands, seemingly innocent of oils, so he paints himself as a debonair gentleman, far removed from his day-to-day -day craft. A late, unusually analytical portrait of Van Dyke's is that of Henry Danvers, Earl of Danby, wearing the knightly attire of the Order of the Garter, an odd crescent-shaped patch, covering an old facial wound won in battle. A scientist, Danvers founded Britain's first botanical garden at Oxford. Ironically, among the painter's most thoughtful, insightful portraits is that of Sir Thomas Chalonnet, who proved to be one of the judges who condemned the artist's greatest patron, Charles I, to death, and Charles I conferred knighthood an extensive patronage upon the painter. In the late 17th, early 18th century, the nations of Europe were swept up in an amazing groundswell of culture. It came from France. Suddenly, French language, French culture, French etiquette, anything French were considered the height of style. This Hermitage palaces might never have been built but for Catherine the Great's desire to emulate the French court. Even the name of these enormous palaces came from a French idea. To the French, a Hermitage was a pleasure pavilion for court games, concerts, and performances. As an enlightened monarch, Catherine the Great wanted Russia to be the equal of any European nation. That was the era of France's son king, Louis XIV. His reign ushered in a French rise to political power and international prominence in art, fashion, etiquette, and language. Where Solomon and Sheba's love is the Bible's major official romance, its formality, except the king's amorous song, makes the other role love story, told both in the Old Testament and the apocryphal book of Esther, far the more winning. This is the tale of a Jewish orphan who becomes the beloved of Persia's king Ahasuerus. The book of Esther, when inscribed upon a scroll, 
known as a Megillah, is a, the traditional present for pious Jewish brides. Poussin's canvas shows Esther's heroic stand just after she had revealed herself as a Jew in order to save her people from death. The policy of mass murder inspired by her husband's evil counselor Haman. In the wondrous fusion of love and valor, Esther, having summoned all her resources for that crucial revelation, faints into the arms of her handmaidens. Jacob finally realized the error of his ways in a long, dark night of the soul. Wrestling with an angel, he came to understand how his meanness was as much against God as against his fellows and vowed to change for the better. This revelation is the subject of Claude's dramatic nocturne, where the winding phalanx, led by Esau, out for fraternal blood, suggests, far from coincidentally, the Roman soldiers coming to arrest Christ after his agony in the garden. One superb canvas, addressed quite literally to this state of the art of still life, provides all the answers. This is Chardon's still life with the attributes of the arts, commissioned by Catherine II in 1766 for the conference hall of St. Petersburg's Academy of Fine Arts. Chardin's most monumental and ambitious painting, it presents a, a pictorial testimony to the artist's vocation. Mercury, messenger of the gods, and their agent of artistic inspiration, fastens a sandal to his winged foot at the canvas's center. The painter shows how raw favor the order and sash at the left rewards the diligent painter, sculptor, or architect who mastered the necessary disciplines of drawing and mathematics, keys to perspective and proportion, to harmony achieved through measure. This painting extols the architect by the presence of the T-square on the sculptor through the centrality of the statue and the presence of the calipers. Chardin, with typical modesty, places the palette and brushes very much to the left, but then the painting itself speaks for the power of his art. History does repeat itself. It took the Russian people to beat Hitler in the Second World War, just as they did Napoleon more than a century before. The Hermitage has a great gallery to commemorate the French invasion and defeat, enjoying a magnificent image of Napoleon at his grandest, in a field marshal's uniform, painted by Antoine Jean Gros, one of the Corsican's favorite painters. Made to look tall and slender, Napoleon rises, in flattering three-quarter length, seen from the left, doubtless his good side, byronically bareheaded. His hair is slightly tousled by the breeze in a pose that echoes Alexandrian grandeur. Napoleon is supposedly on the bridge at Arcol, where he defeated the Austrians in 1796. In the mid-1860s, Impressionism burst into the scene with Claude Monet's Lady in the Garden. The Impressionists wanted a more modern expression in painting, seeking to capture the moment by placing dabs of unmixed color immediately beside one another to blend in the eye of the observer. Monet in particular painted outdoors in his search to capture the essence of reality. His work became an intense scrutiny of light and color to produce what he felt was a higher reality. Monet often brought several canvases with him when he painted outdoors, 
painting each one for a short time and then changing them along with the light. He painted haystacks many times, fascinated by the transformations of the haystacks, fields and trees in different lighting. He created the illusion of forms bathed in the atmosphere. The Impressionists believe that the color of an object is transformed by light and reflections. Each object had not one color but many, and these colors placed immediately beside one another, in short, choppy brushstrokes, created a vibrating quality that mimicked the movement of light. He painted 16 views of London's Waterloo Bridge. Some were so obscured by the atmosphere that the forms became nearly indecipherable. A painting of fog. This is Camille Pizarro's Boulevard Montmartre in Paris, painted from a hotel window in 1897. The work is a poetic vision of a brassy, dynamic street life of Paris. Carriages and figures, trees and buildings, all meld into an impression of movement. No individual figure or object is decipherable. The Impressionist notion that there are paintings of sensations were actually realist works is paralleled by the philosophical theory of the age. Scientists, philosophers and modern psychological thinkers propose that reality is only a sensation and everything we know is filtered through sensation. In his Place des Arts Francaises in Paris, painted in 1898, Pissarro records his visual sensations of this bustling square. Painting from a hotel window once again, he catches the momentary effects of light and scurrying figures, all soon to disappear. Both of the studies included here, woman combing her hair and woman at her toilette are in pastel an unusually fugitive medium, sharing the precision of drawing and the color of painting, ideally suited to Degas art, as its broad strokes seem to hold and radiate light while defining form. He worked mainly in pastel chalk on paper. He loved the subject of a private moment. Degas models are often alone except for the presence of the viewer of which they are unaware. The historian Henri Fusion noted how the color blue is the essence of French art. Cezanne belongs to that list. Blue lies at the core of his vision. It is his vision. Blue rings the tonal bell, releasing the painter's wordless poetry as seen in the banks of the Marne or blue landscape. Without blue, there's trouble, found in young girl at the piano, where trapped indoors, deprived of day's light, the only beauty lies in Wagner's unheard sound. The troubled genius Vincent van Gogh came to France in 1886 after unsuccessful careers as an art dealer, a pastor, and an evangelical preacher. After his failed careers, confounded by his unhappy experiences with women, he withdrew to southern France, where he found excitement in the Arlesian sun and his deeply felt emotional painting. His intense temperament lent tremendous expressive force to his painting, but that same temperament likely led to his early death by suicide in 1890. 
Van Gogh is said to have tried to kill his friend Gauguin, who visited Arles but refused to remain in town and paint. Van Gogh cut off his own ear as a gift to a lady of easy charm with negotiable affections. Soon after, he was hospitalized on a petition from the townspeople of Arles. Today, it is believed that he suffered from schizophrenia. Nevertheless, in his lilac bush, he celebrates the ongoing miracle of nature, one of annual death and resurrection, in an image so antithetical to the artist's tragic last months in Arles. While visiting Italy in 1884, Rodin was overwhelmed by the spiritual intensity of Michelangelo's half-finished sculptures left in rough-hewn blocks of marble. Like Michelangelo before him, Rodin leaves his figures immersed in the raw marble. The physical mass of unarticulated stone represents the earthbound nature of their love. The faces and bodies of these carnal figures are forever fused as if melted together in an eternal embrace. The features of the man and the woman are not carved. They are only suggested by the indefinite surfaces that blend the light and dark into the ephemeral blurs and smudges. In his poet and muse, Rodin's daring emphasis and distortions achieve a breathtaking expressionistic effect. His figures approach the abstract and marble becomes a fluid medium for the portrayal of human sensuality and motion. Rodin contrasts the roughly chiseled marble with the smoothness of the skin. The finely polished flesh and muscle seem to melt back into the stone from which they emerged. Rodin, a contemporary of Claude Monet, achieved his own form of Impressionism in sculpture. In the autumn of 1905, a large exhibition of entirely new works opened in Paris. There an art critic saw paintings that surpassed all imagination. Struggling for the right words to describe his horror, the phrases like pictorial aberration or color madness came to mind. He wrote that in this room you would be among the pictures like you would be among wild animals or bit fauve in French. In his negative review he had coined the name of the movement, fauvism. Fourth painters found Impressionist colors a bit boring. Inspired by the reclusive post-Impressionists, Cezanne, Gauguin and Van Gogh, the Fauves entered into a daring experiment with color. Disregarding the actual appearance of the natural world, they applied savage splashes of pure pigment to the canvas. They painted for the beauty of paint itself. Many who saw their works were disturbed by the fact that they set aside concerns about what objects and people actually look like. They sought instead an inner emotional reality of what the forms and people felt like. Critics likened their works to the creations of a child, set loose with a new set of crayons. Matisse painted his famous Harmony in Red in 1908. In his innovative use of this striking red background, he balances the two forces that would come to dominate his painting, line and color. The conversation seems an ironic title for a canvas whose couple, the artist and his wife, may have reached a place of stalemate or at least a polite standoff. Separating them, the windows alive with the lyrical undulation of raw tie and grillwork seen just before a garden 
its blue ovals, ready to float into the couple's equally blue room. The couple's pose and placement recall figures on Greek funerary reliefs, where the deceased is often seated, always shown alive, opposite a standing deity, guide to the next world. Far taller than her column-like companion, the woman holds a pose endowed with the splendor of an enthroned archaic goddess. By joining hands in their magical ritual circle dance, five short-haired women, their skins and elemental red between clay and fire, bring together heaven and earth. So that same year, he would complete the dance, one of the two works that some believe mark the high point in his career. It was commissioned by the Moscow collector and patron Shukin, whose collection was requisitioned by the government in the years of Soviet power. The dance was hung over the staircase of Shukin's mansion. Matisse remembered the day he painted the dance. I went on Dimanche, Sunday, and watched them dance the Farandella. On coming home, I invented my own dance on the canvas, four meters long, humming the tune I just overheard, so the whole composition, all the dancers, move in a constant rhythm. Matisse was charmed by the subject of dancing, and it even occupied the painter's mind for several years. That's why it came out, as it were, in one breath. The second of Matisse's great works of this period is his music, also commissioned by Shukin, designed as a companion piece to the dance. Matisse said that he intended the musical theme to respond to the silence of Shukin's mansion. Vast fields of pure color saturate the canvas, isolating individual figures, surrounding them with lines. The ever-changing colors of his Fauvist period have disappeared into the realm of abstraction, where pure forms and pure colors are separated by simple lines. He creates intensity by simplifying the form and design to the essentials. In their living room, the same artist paints his wife and their three children in a rather studiedly informal grouping. The boys play checkers as their sister sews. Their mother takes a mildly supervisory stance, letter or yellow paper-bound book in hand. Here Matisse goes back to a popular 18th century genre known as the conversation piece where the stiff collectivity of the family portrait was to be diminished by a recreation of some domestic scene. Decorative art helped keep them together. The wildly varied patterns of carpet, checkerboard, two divans, wallpaper, tiled mantelpiece, and of its embroidered cloth-bearing vases, separated by a Matisse statue, a certain individuality all too separate but equal, that quality not yet permissible in wife or children. Matisse's use of pattern was stimulated by his visit to Munich for a large Islamic exhibition the preceding year. Here the interior is realized in almost mosaic fashion. This painter's vivid authoritative color code becoming the law for countless 20th century artists, whether working on inner, outer, or purely abstract spaces. Many are charmed by the cheerful and decorative works of Matisse. Appreciating the expressive language of Pablo Picasso can be another matter. Picasso transformed the art world and dominated painting for the first half of the 20th century with his intense originality. Seeking deeper visual truths, he created the language of abstraction, 
shattering Renaissance limitations in painting that dominated art for over 400 years. In his Blue Period, his melancholic subjects are the poor in the outcasts of a modern city. His works convey a state of eternal mourning, longing, and sadness. As a young painter, Picasso had little interest in the effects of Impressionism. His work reflects his interest in form and uniquely Spanish emotional quality. This is the visit of 1902, sometimes called the Two Sisters. It is thought that the work was inspired by the silhouettes he saw at a woman's prison of St. Lazare in Paris. A morbid, emotional, highly personal mood pervades the canvas. Notice that he ignores all the traditional reality in depicting the eye the way the ancient Egyptians did from a frontal view. Portrait of Solaire from 1903 was painted on a return trip home to Spain. The man is Picasso's tailor in Barcelona. To pay his tailoring bill, Picasso painted this work as well as the portrait of Solaire's wife. It belongs to Picasso's blue period, of course, the youthful phase of his career that would last until about 1905. By 1906, his palette would turn to rose, and afterwards, he would launch himself into the world of abstraction, where both blue and rose would become irrelevant. In the dance with veils, the dancer's swirling, seductively movemented veils are negated by the dancer's crudely carved wooden head its features clock stoppingly close to the many tribal sculptures. Picasso's new view of the world paralleled developments in science, which proposed that our perceptions are based not on one view, but on a succession of views and their memories. While critics had attacked colorful fauvism for its distortions of human form, Cubism massacred human form, deeming it irrelevant to the painting as a whole. The ideas behind Cubism were the ideas of Cezanne, who came up with the notion that all nature could be broken into pure forms, cubes, cones, spheres, and rectangles. Another vanitas, Picasso's composition with a skull also includes the skull and pipe, typical for that theme, along with references to the transience of art, the painter's palette and brushes, and a work in progress. Musical instruments fractured into abstract designs become a favorite subject. It is a decorative painting of interlocking shapes and patterns with no clear distinction between forms and the space around them. Picasso saw a direct association between music and art. He was a close friend with the modernist composer Igor Stravinsky, who in 1910 wrote his Firebird Suite. Violin and guitar were painted in 1913, the same year Stravinsky would compose The Rites of Spring with its wild rhythms, dissonant harmonies and delicate tones. His painting was an analysis of the cubist nature of forms, or analytical cubism. But about the time of outbreak of World War I, his restless, innovative painting entered a new stage, synthetic cubism. He began to build up the canvas with textures and real objects to make a collage that sometimes projected from the surface. 
In 1914, he created a composition with a bunch of grapes and cut pear. Picasso began to question whether paintings actually have to be made of paint. This work was fashioned out of paper, gouache, sawdust, and tempera. The grapes are simply cut out of a sheet of paper. The White Hall was designed to house formal receptions. The predominance of the color white visually enlarges the size of the room. The hall is prodigiously decorated with the sculptures of antique heroes. Flanking the arches and pairs, the statues of the Olympic gods served as the sculptural vision of the program of the future emperor's reign. The heavy bronze chandeliers bear the images of war trophies and add a peculiar coloring to the composition of the interior. Abundant in glittering gilt, the gold parlor bears a remote resemblance to the ancient chambers of the Moscow Kremlin with their vaulted ceilings and ornate walls. However, the hostess herself used to compare this parlor with the throne hall of Bavarian kings. The parlor played the role of a formal reception room. Standing out among the furnishings of the gold parlor is the gorgeous fireplace. Its marble base is decorated with the figures of caryatids and bas reliefs. The inlaid panel depicting antique ruins was crafted using the technique of Roman mosaics. All this makes the fireplace look like a grandiose architectural structure. In the large or crimson study, designed by Andrei Stackenschneider, the Empress received her personal guests and met the members of the imperial family. The study also served as an informal music salon. The pattern of the fabric stretched on the walls and the carving of the doors displayed numerous images of musical instruments and notes. The frame of the huge mantelpiece mirror is crowned with cupids holding an escutcheon featuring the monogram of the Empress Maria Alexandrovna, M.A. The boudoir, or the small study, was one of the favorite rooms of Maria Alexandrovna. It was designed in the middle of the 19th century by the architect Harold Bosset in the second Rococo style fashionable at the time. The atmosphere of this room gives the impression of a fairy tale. Shimmering gilt outlines the slender semi-figures of snow-white caryatids. A splendid bronze chandelier is reflected in variously shaped mirrors. Empress Maria spent a lot of her spare time in her cozy boudoir, reading writing letters to her relatives or having tea with her husband. A door opens from here to the stairs, leading downstairs to the rooms of her children on the first floor. The rotunda is connected with the dark corridor. Daylight never comes here. Its walls, partitioned by mighty Doric columns, are covered with Western European tapestries of the 16th and 17th centuries. Tapestries were never designed or made as isolated works of art. They were produced in series to decorate a certain room. Hung closely together in a row, they entirely covered the walls and the doors. At the juncture of the northern and western buildings of the Winter Palace, there's an unusually shaped room. It is the rotunda. 
The room owes its name to the Italian word rotondo, which means round. The first rotunda in the Winter Palace was built in the 1830s by the French architect Auguste Montferrand. His design was inspired by the domed circular temples of ancient Rome. After the fire of 1837, the interior of the rotunda was restored by Alexander Brulov. He raised the dome considerably, making it, according to one of the contemporaries, lofty and bold. The broad band of the gallery gently envelops the perfectly round space of the room. Natural illumination streams through the skylight. A majestic pattern shines on the polished floor as if reflected in a gigantic mirror. The Malachite Room, designed in 1838-39 by the architect Alexander Brulov, has no parallel in the world, with, as the name implies, Malachite facing the columns and pilasters and adorning mantelpieces and the furniture. The decoration of the room took over 2,000 kilos of malachite. Gilding was also used on a wide scale, mainly for the moldings of the bronze capitals and the bases of the columns. Ormolu decorates mantelpieces, mirror frames, and the paper mache molded designs covering the major part of the ceiling. An original an effective blend of two materials, bright green malachite and glistening gold, give the interior an air of magnificence and splendor. The impression is enhanced by the beautiful parquet floor made up of nine different kinds of wood. The malachite room and the neighboring private dining room are directly associated with the stirring events of October Revolution of 1917 in Petrograd, as St. Petersburg was renamed after the outbreak of World War I. In July of 1917, the bourgeois provisional government took over the Malachite Room as the venue for its cabinet meetings. After the Winter Palace was stormed on October 25, 1917, the Revolutionary Red Guards, soldiers and sailors, arrested the ministers of the Provisional Government in the private dining room to which they had retired after the assault began. This historic event occurred at 10 past 2 in the morning of October 26. The remains of the saint and blessed prince, the heavenly patron of St. Petersburg, were transferred from the city of Vladimir to the northern capital in 1724. They still rest at the Alexander Nevsky Monastery. In the middle of the 18th century, following the decree of Empress Elizabeth, a magnificent shrine was made at the St. Petersburg Mint, out of 1,500 kilos of pure transbaikal silver to encase the relics of Alexander Nevsky. In 1922, when this splendid masterpiece of Russian arts and crafts was in danger of being melted down, the cultural community of Petrograd succeeded in protecting the masterpiece by displaying it at the Hermitage. At the very center of this solemn ensemble, a multi-tiered pyramid is raised with the image of Alexander Nevsky against the background of ermine robes. On both sides of the pyramid, the figures of angels are holding cartouche plates with engraved texts praising the saint and blessed prince and Empress Elizabeth. A sarcophagus rests at the base of the pyramid, its walls bearing bar-reliefs with scenes from the life of Alexander Nevsky. 
The tomb is augmented with pedestals displaying weaponry and tall incense burning censers. The interior of the concert hall emanates peace and harmony. The room, decorated with the sculptures of Greek muses, was generally used to give concerts to the members of the imperial family and accommodate small concert halls for a limited circle of invited guests. Britain's young Queen Victoria was struck by the Tsar's unbending nature and wrote on his state visit to England. He is stern and severe with fixed principles of duty, which nothing on earth will make him change. He is sincere, I'm certain, even in his most despotic acts, in the sense that that's the only way to govern. The Tsar Nicholas II was a handsome, amiable man, whom his English cousin, the Prince of Wales, called weak as water. The stronger of the two, Alexandra, adored her husband Nicky, whom she regarded as a child in need of protection from the plots and schemes of worldly men. <laughs>